Hello. There we go. Hi. We're live now. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am Melissa Aldrin, and I lead education programs at Unity Technologies. I wanted to thank uh, Reddy, big thank you to Reddy for bringing us together. We collaborate with Reddy on a few activities. This is one of those, and this is a great one. Um, anyway, I'm here today if you have any questions throughout the webinar. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Unity. Many of you have probably heard of Unity. Maybe you're already Unity creators yourselves. If you haven't heard of us, Unity is a leading 2D, 3D virtual and augmented reality engine that is behind the majority of games and interactive development. So um, everything from Klepto Kitties to, um, gosh, what are some other good ones? Monument Valley. I, I play a lot Cuphead. of- Cuphead. What is it? Cuphead. Cuphead. I've not heard of Cuphead. <laughs> it's on Xbox. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of ton of games that you know um, that are are run by Unity. Unity is the physics and the interactivity behind those games. Today, we're going to talk about jumping into an activity, starting on the Ready platform, and then migrating over to Unity. Ready is a great place to begin your journey into, in, into interactive game design. And once you've got a good point in your learning, you can migrate your stuff from Ready to Unity, where you can add more complex motion, graphics, and interactivity. There are many activities you can do on Ready's platform that will take you to Unity. And there are tons of resources available for learning Unity. Mark pulled those up right here. This is our, our Learn website here. And I recommend starting at the very beginning with those interactive tutorials, the roll of ball, um, are, all, are all meant for the beginning Unity user. Tonight's webinar will be a great way to jump into both Ready and Unity. Thank you for joining and for showing your spirit for the Global Hour of Code. It should be a great time tonight and a great week ahead. And thank you, Mark Suter, for leading tonight. Um, hey. Mark works for Ready. I'll let him introduce himself, but please take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I am, whoa, sharing screen all over the place. Um, <laughs> I am Mark Suter. I teach high school computer science, really. I used to teach sixth grade through high school computer science. So I've been kind of doing this transition from ready and that type of program into Unity then. So today I wanted to show you uh, how to build something specifically inside of Ready, and then some of the overlap between Ready and Unity and how you can then take those steps. When you feel comfortable with Ready, you might be ready to take that next step into Unity. So let me share my screen one more time. Share. There we go. Um, on the Hour of Code page, there was a link to this, the game of codes. If you just went to the getready.io page where you can download Ready, um, this is where you could download the software. It's good for Mac, PC, the mobile devices, Chromebooks. You could do it through all of those. So that's a really nice feature is that it doesn't matter what device you're on, you can be developing these games. So if you click on the learn section, there's a whole bunch of little uh, informational things, but this is where we're gonna be starting at today. I'll give you a quick tour of the Ready interface. And this is the page we're gonna be starting on. Um, back to, let's jump to Ready. I wanna show you kind of the interface, uh, just a quick overview. Uh, this is our stage here, the entire canvas that the player would see. And I'm gonna add a background in here right away because it's hard for me to see where the white ends and the background doesn't sometimes because I'm colorblind. Um, so, which is always an adventure when you're teaching and you're colorblind. Kids make funny a lot, but I can take it. I'm strong. Um, so this area here is what the player would actually see. And you can place things all around here while you're building, kind of like that's your, your playground area. So as you could see already, when you hit the plus button, you can add all sorts of things, anything from uh, Jiffy. And yes, I do say Jiffy instead of Giffy. Um, they're GIFs because the announce or the creator gets to determine how it's pronounced, I guess. Um, you can upload your own graphics, uh, which I have some in there. You can 
Whoa, I just went into GFE. Oh, no, this is going to be a hot mess. Oh, geez, get out of here. Um, just kidding. It's fine. It's all curated, actually. So if you're a teacher, you really don't have to worry about it too much. Um, the, the basic shapes is going to be where we start out. It's basically what you think it would be. Artwork, uh, interface, and text. Um, there's a whole bunch of interactives here. We'll be using the built-in timer. You can actually hook it up to little physical computing devices called Arduino, um, kind of along the lines of Raspberry Pi, a little bit different. Um, built-in behaviors that allow you to make characters fly in a direction with a speed. You can make them make it a platformer game, you know, a Super Mario style game or Mega Man game. Um, all kinds of built-in behaviors, which is what makes getting started and ready um, just that, that that simple so that when you get into Unity, you have a concept of a lot of the game development um, fundamentals already. So over on the other side, uh, you know what, let's just get started because um, I remember being a student and sometimes the teacher would just kind of talk at me and I'd be like, why don't you just get into building the fun stuff? And so now that I'm kind of a teacher, I try to do that as much as I can. Um, so let's just go ahead and do that. Uh, so Game of Codes, this is our uh, kind of like a Flappy Bird game. And I actually found this website, flappybird.io. Um, as you can see, I'm really amazing at it. Um, this is kind of a the game that we're making this Game of Codes spinoff of. And oh my goodness, I'm horrible at this. But it's kind of nice if you go play this game for a little bit, you can see the momentum is going down and I'm hitting the space bar to make it fly up. Well, what if you're on a on a mobile device or something? Um, the game that we're going to be making, you would be able to actually uh, use Unity and export through Unity as a standalone app uh, for Android or iOS. So I'm going to actually show you uh, how to get going that direction and uh, it'll be fun. So back in here. First, we're going to do what I like to do is uh, get all my pieces together and throw them all into the stage. And then I start doing kind of the coding um, actions. So basically, we're going to get all of these pieces. Um, and I'm actually going to move this out of my way so I can actually see what I'm doing a little bit easier. But you saw what page I'm going to be kind of referencing from here so that if you get behind or you need to do some catching up, you can follow that too. Um, I'm going to throw in uh, the basic circle. You're probably wondering, why are we throwing a circle in here? This is like dragons flying around. It'll make more sense in just a second. Um, under artwork, let's get our dragon. Now, why are there two dragons? Well, as you know, animation... Uh, as you might, might know, animation is basically a series of pictures, one right after another, and it happens so fast that we actually think it's motion, real motion, and it's really just uh, animation, right? That's what film is, uh, video. So if we have an up and a down, we can put it together and make it look like he's flapping or flying. Uh, clear that search, and let's get the ice staff here, this little pokey looking thing. Um, let's get a square, basic shapes. Let's get our square, throw that in there. And out of the interface and text, let's get the timer. Now the timer is gonna sort of act as our score. Um, I'm going to kind of resize these things and make sure they're not solid. So as you can see, when you click an object, you, uh, have these new buttons that pop up over here. The appearance is exactly what you think it is. Uh, what does it look like visually? You can change its uh, dimensions here. So like 0 0.3, 0 0.3, it doesn't matter what size that circle is necessarily. Um, that's basically gonna be your hitbox for when the ice staff is trying to hit stuff. So if you wanna make it real easy on yourself, you make that uh, really small, but let's do something about like this. Um, solid, I'm going to turn that off because I don't, uh, you can detect collisions with this off. In other words, you don't have to have that on unless you want things to like bounce off of it. That's uh, an easy way to think about that one. Um, and the rest of this is not so much going to matter, except one thing I will point out at the bottom is the collider. Now, all that means is 
what shape is the invisible area that it's trying to detect this thing in our game, whether this thing hit it. So if you were using like a box collider, it would literally have an invisible uh, rectangle or square around it. And as soon as this ice shard hit like right there, it would consider it collided with. You've probably played video games where something hits you and you think, no, no way, that thing didn't hit me. Well, it didn't look like it hit you, but it probably hit your collider. And that's another um, thing that goes right into Unity is it uses colliders to determine whether you actually collided with something. Um, and just real quick, like I kind of want to hop back and forth once in a while to show you uh, a few equivalent things in between uh, Unity and Ready. Um, you can add all sorts of colliders in here. If I add like a collider to this little circle thing, I don't know why you would add a box collider to it, but you could. Um, and it would be this box shape. So just quickly in, in Unity, we have our things that exist in our game. This is like your level editor window, the scene. This is what the player would see, the game view. This is like all your settings called the inspector and all your files live down there. So it's a, it's a real nice interface, uh, but colliders, um, are very common uh, overlap between the two. So all that just to say that your appearance, the collider, do we really need a polygon, which as you might remember, is a flat sided shape with uh, any number of sides. We don't really need to check all sorts of little flat sides. So we should probably just make that a circle collider. The problem is if you went and did like this as a polygon collider, <laughs> That would be really bad because it's literally trying to check every little piece of this dragon every single frame. It's got to check all that entire border. Seems like a lot of work. A way to think of it is if you had to take a pair of scissors and cut that thing out, would it be a lot of work? Yes, yes, it would. Well, guess what? Your phone that's trying to do the same math and calculations doesn't like doing that much work either. So it's one way to think of it. But because we're not actually going to be colliding with these things, it doesn't so much matter. But it's something to consider when you're making a game. So um, in our code, we're going to do a little bit of what I call pseudo code. Um, and that is where you, you basically... Uh, pretend that you say it in plain English. So when the game starts, I want this thing to follow the circle and I want this thing to follow the circle. And then we're gonna use momentum to determine which frame is it on. Is it showing the up wings or the down wings? So while I'm building it, it doesn't even matter where I place these dragons. Um, although I am going to shrink them because they are way too large. So 0.5 there, I think is a good size. Yeah, that's not too bad. Zoom in a little bit so you can see better. Is 0 0.5 there and 0 0.5 there. Okay. We have that. We have this square. This square is actually going to be just our spawner. Um, in Unity, they would call it instantiate, which is just a fancy word for spawn to create other objects. So this thing in our game is going to be off the screen, but for now I'm going to leave it on. It's going to be bouncing up and down. And every so often, it's going to create one of these things, which is going to go flying across the screen, and we're trying to avoid it, right? It's kind of a spin-off of the Flappy Bird, and that's going to uh, uh, make the game. And as soon as we get hit, the timer will stop. I'm going to actually increase the size of this so I can actually see my timer. That looks good. Now, what do we have so far when we hit play? Well, nothing's moving. So we want to add a behavior it's called to this circle so that it basically gets pulled down by gravity and we can press a button to make it jump. So under behavior, we can hit add behavior and it brings out the appropriate menu. Um, we want to add the jump behavior. You can see I'm kind of press and holding and then just drag it over. That's because you can use that same press and hold and drag if you are developing on the phone. It's actually kind of fun to develop on a tablet or a phone because um, you can't do that too often with too many programs. Um, and I'm going to use the space bar to make it jump. So when I hit play, 
you can see I can now hit the space bar. There's an on-screen space bar. So if you're playing on mobile, you have something for your finger to poke on to do the jumping, right? Actually works pretty good. In fact, I'm going to turn on the physics here. Even though it was using some rudimentary physics to begin with, this gives us the ability to affect like its drag. The amount of drag is, imagine somebody falling with a parachute. Right, they have a lot more drag. That's why a parachute exists, is to give the person more drag. Because without the parachute, they have almost well much less drag, which makes them go a little bit too fast. Um, so you can see it still functions that way. But if I wanted to, we could do some adjusting with the uh, the drag just to see what it would do. If you wanted to make it, you know, a little easier. <laughs> right, you could do that, but um, these are how you would make all these little adjustments as you go. Um, I want this uh, ice staff to be flying across the screen, and that's another behavior. That is the bullet behavior. Anytime you want something going in a straight line at a um, constant speed, you can use the bullet behavior. And I want this one to be going to the left, which would be a 180. And I'm going to leave the rest of this stuff alone. Um, this spawner box that's going to start down here, I'm just going to tell it to go up. And then we'll use code to make it kind of turn around and reverse its speed every uh, second or so. So let's get the upwards bullet behavior on there. Go to behavior, add, press and hold on bullet, drag that in. And I want to set that to uh, up 90 degrees. Okay, so now if we hit play just to see what's going on. All right, good. So the spawner went up and went flying off the screen and is still going up into infinity. And then now it's, I think it's time to actually do a little bit of the, the uh, coding part. Um, so inside of the little stoplight here, this is where the magic happens. This is where you get to control all of the little pieces and actually create the game. So we want dragons to jump onto that circle every single frame. We need them to basically ride along on top of that circle. And that gives us the illusion of a flapping dragon then. So when we click on this, it gives you relevant options. And because we're dealing with uh, frames, that's a system thing. So I want to say when system runtime every frame what do I want it to do? Well, I want the dragon up. I want his position, and I could set it to a number, an X, Y. I want to set it to an object, to the circle. And with the plus sign here, I also want the dragon down, his position set to an object of the circle. That way it doesn't matter Oh, and make sure you name these, because once you get a whole bunch of these, um, set dragon to circle, because you can collapse these into little modular pieces, which is a good way to learn coding, is to put everything in little chunks, take a big problem and break it into little chunks. The fancy computer science word is abstraction. Um, by naming these, then you can uh, keep track of where you're at, because we're going to be coming back to some of these later. Let's make sure we got something going on. Hey, we got it following that. It looks nice. Um, we could actually lower the opacity on this so it doesn't look quite so in the way. Um, but I like having it somewhat visible so I can remember that that is in fact working. <laughs> um, so next, we're going to actually make it look like it's flapping. So we're going to go in here, add a new event, and I'm going to call this uh, flap up. And when should the flap up graphic be there? Well, we're going to actually be doing that based on the momentum of, uh, or the velocity of the circle. So when the circle, and something to do with its physics, when its physics, velocity is greater than, and two is a good number for that, what should happen when the velocity is bigger than that? Well, we want to see the downward flap. So we're going to turn off the upward flap. We're going to set his uh, appearance, set opacity, and I'm going to drop that to off. 
and I'm going to make the down appearance set velocity to 100, right? Because if you're going up, it kind of looks like you already flapped. And so it would be wings down. And then as you fall, it would look like the wings are up. So we're going to do the exact opposite for the next one. So let's go and add a new event and basically do the exact same thing and say when the circle physics velocity is less than, and I'll do the same thing, two meters per second, then what should happen? Well, we want the dragon up to be seen. So we're gonna set his appearance, set opacity to 100, and we wanna hide the other one. So we want the dragon down uh, appearance set opacity zero. So, oops, don't forget to name these. Um, I'll call that flap down, makes sense. And you know what I forgot to do already? I'm a horrible teacher. Is, well, first of all, you gotta have some cool little icon, right? So I'll do this, zoom into my little dragony guy, hit save. Um, but also, this save here is what saves your game to basically to the cloud. It's syncing it to the cloud so that you can access it later and keep editing it somewhere else on a different computer, on a phone. Um, game of whoops, game of codes. And I'll hit the save button. When this little whirly gig here is done spinning, it's actually saved. And good. And it goes pew. Okay. Let's see if that works. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. That looks pretty good. Yeah, got a nice little animation going on there. Looks nice. Um, now, we got this ice thing flying at us. The initial one, I'm going to kind of hide off the screen here because he's going to be, this spawner is going to be creating its own um, little ice shards flying at us. So in order to get this guy to change direction, we're going to um, add a new event for that. So I can collapse these by hitting this little down arrow here. So let's add an event and say, let's say the cloner up, up, down, so we know what that's doing. And how often do we want it to be changing direction? About once every second. So again, we're dealing with um, the system time. So system, runtime, repeat every, and set that to one. So every second, what do I want it to do? Well, I want the square uh, his uh, bullet movement, I want that to be mirrored. So in other words, if he's going down, it starts going up and vice versa. So let's make sure that is in fact. Woo, it's kind of going off the screen a little bit. I feel like the thing's going a little fast. Let's actually slow that down just a little bit. Yeah, that looks a lot better. My dragon just fell to its death. Um, save often, kids. You never know when lightning will strike. Uh, this thing needs to actually create some ice, some cloned ice. So how often do we want it to really be cloning ice? Well, we're going to go through the quick version now, and then I'll show you how to spice things up a little bit with uh, by using a variable. So let's first do it this way, and we'll just call this the clone ice so to make it look random for now, we're just going to say system runtime repeat every. And like you could use, just don't do use like 0 0.5 or 1 because it's always going to kind of show up in the same spot because he changes direction every 1. So just use any number that's not a regular interval. That way it kind of looks like it's random. So when repeat every 0.58 seconds, do... Well, we want the spawner, the square, to clone, clone an object. We want it to clone the staff thing. So when we play it, oh, you see how it's kind of moving the box around? You know why that is? That is because I forgot to turn something solid to off. <laughs> so let's make sure we... Oh, there we go. Turn that off because they're basically colliding with each other and shoving each other around like brothers. 
Um, so we need to turn those off so that they're not like shoving each other around. Ah, oh, oof, fix that one. See, it kind of looks random. It's really not random. It's actually a regular interval, um, but it'll work for now. And I'll show you later how you can actually uh, mix that up a little bit. Um, so now, how do you actually lose the game, right? Right now, you can just play and you don't, it doesn't matter if you get hit by anything, right? So to pseudocode this, what would you say? If you were explaining it in plain English, and this is how I like to make any video game when I'm trying to figure out what do I code here. So, well, I know this is going up and down. I know these things are flying out of it. So when the uh, dragon or when the ice senses that it hit, and I'm not going to check if it hit this or it hit this. All I have to do is say if it hit this, because the dragons are riding on top of that circle, right? So it the ice, or really any of the pieces of ice, right? It's may, it's not going to be this one. This one's going to fly past underneath here, and then it's going to spawn new ones. So how do we say, well, any of the ice things, if any of the ice things hits the circle, then, you know, the game's over, stop the clock, you know, all that stuff. So what we really need to do here is we're going to add what's called a class, which is going to be able to uh, encapsulate or group these um, uh, all the ice shards. So with the ice staff selected, I'm going to go to this bucket here. It says classes. So it's not like a classroom class. It's actually, it kind of is. It's like a group. Um, and I'm going to call this ice shards. Save class, and it's in the class. So that way, when it makes new ones of it, it is also in the ice shards class. All of them are. So I don't have to check every single ice shards with a different line of code. That would be, uh, that would get old. That would get old quick. So let's go in here. Let's add a new element. And in uh, game development, you might call this a moment. In other words, it is that one moment in time that triggers the end. The end is nigh. So when does that lose moment start? Well, as we established, when any of the ice hits the circle. So when, and this is where you want to be careful, don't choose ice staff, because that is only that one singular ice staff. And that's bad, because that one's not going to hit the circle. One of the clones might, but not this one, which is why we created. Now we can say when the ice shards class senses or is sensing it collide uh you could do collided with or is touching the circle so you can see when all in the shards or really any of them senses it's touching the boarded circle well what should happen a lot of things should happen we're gonna tint or color the dragons so we're gonna say dragon up your appearance i'm gonna set the color We'll go to this red and the dragon down appearance set color set that to a red and basically we want to shove the dragon or the circle really because they're following the circle push that circle off the bottom of the screen and we're using physics so to make it feel like there's a heavy weight on its back and it can't fly anymore we're going to add some downward force to it. So do bordered circle, something in the physics. And here are these little hammer swinging things. Um, we're going to add a relative force down. Uh, there it is. So basically, it's like <laughs> swinging a hammer and hitting the circle on top. So it makes it like uh, push way down. And 400N, what is that, Newtons? It's been a while since I've had a physics class. Um, oh, and the timer should stop, right? So there's a lot of do things here, all when this one lose moment happens, right? So we want the uh, timer, its timer label. We want to change its active state. So we want to have the set active to no or false. And while we're at it, we might as well hide any remaining glass shards <clears throat> so it doesn't look like it's in the way so uh 
all of these appearance set opacity down to zero. So you just can't even see them anymore. Let's see what happens. So oh, it worked. Timer stopped. And that really, I mean, you could stop right there and say, hey, I've got a video game. I mean, you do. It's essentially what it is. The only problem I have with that, if you're really paying attention, what is the difference between, if I drag this over here, between the game we just made, and I know there are ice shards come across instead of pipes in the way, but in this one, what happens if I just let them fall? Well, what happens in my game when that happens? If I start the game and I just let them fall, I could cheat very easily and uh, just kind of keep winning here. Sorry, I had to take a drink of water. So we can fix that. And we need to know basically when what. Well, let's pseudo code that. And when the circle gets lower than, well, about right here. Right? Well, how do we know where that's at? Well, I just so happen to have conveniently made... Uh, I better save this because, as you well know, I'll probably screw something up. I'm known for that. You know, that's kind of what I'm famous for. I'm going to exit out of this one. And in Ready, you have all your projects. They're, uh, like, cloud-synced. Um, so here's a project I made a while back that it's really not even a game. It's just something to help uh, myself remember where everything is. Like, there's literally nothing to do. But it shows you on the Ready platform where the coordinates are. So this is the X, the left and right, and then the Y up and down. Uh, same coordinate system in Unity. So if I wanted to say, well, uh, when the game starts, I want the circle to be at negative 2, X, and positive, I don't know, 1.5, that would start my dragon right here. Okay, so let's verify that. Let's go throw that into, well, actually, I'm just going to make a note of that real quick because I want to show you the other part. When we should lose is when the dragon falls below, and I would say if you go below um, 1.5 on the y-axis, uh, game over. That's the end. So let's go back into my projects. Let's go into here. And you can see you can actually share right from here. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and edit, but you could remix it and make it a whole new different game, which you can do that with other people's games too, which is kind of nice because you, if you see a game you like, you're like, how did they do that? You can actually look under the hood or see behind the curtain if this was Wizard of Us and see how they did do that. So we want to say when the circle gets below blank, it should lose. Well, let's look at our, our code here. Now, that's all part of the lose moment, isn't it? Like, this is what happens when you lose, but the top is the only way to lose so far. You only lose when the ice hits the circle. So what we can do is hit a plus here, and it's not going to be both of these, but it could be you get hit by the ice or you go too low, right? Either one of those things could trigger all of this losey type stuff. So we want to say, or when what? What did we say? When the bordered circle, its position is what? Is above a coordinate, above object, below coordinate. Let's try that. If it is below, do you remember what we said it was? I'm going from memory here, and I really hope I'm correct here. Negative 1.5. If I'm wrong, somebody scream at me, please. But I think that's right. Um, let's just try it. Let's see what happens. Let's see if I can recover from it with that downward force. So I'm flying. I'm, uh oh, yep, that was it. Game over, man. Look at that. We already solved that problem. So I can go along here. Everything's good. Ugh falls down. Sweet. So now you can't fall off the bottom of the screen. That's one cheater's thing fixed. Um, the other one is I want to have a little variation in how often these ice shards are coming out, right? Because if you're if you kind of figure out the pattern here, 
you could probably go for a long oh my gosh as soon as i say that you could probably go for a long time oh my goodness i'm really bad at this you get the idea and i'm good at it but you could go for a long time anyways how do we make that get harder increasingly harder because that's typically what video games do they ramp up the difficulty once you uh, get used to the scene so instead of right now it's creating a ice shard every how often if we look in the clone ice we're saying um, every 0.58 seconds clone the ice staff well what we can do let's save this real quick what we can do is instead of saying 0.58 and that's like hard coding in um, the value. I'm going to use a variable. And a variable is exactly what it sounds like. It is a uh, container that can hold any kind of information. In our case, it's going to hold a number. It can hold anything, and it might vary or change. So I'm going to call this the spawn rate, and it's going to be a number save and at the very beginning i'm going to make it match what we already have just to prove that this actually works so spawn rate is 0.58 now is it going to spawn at that rate no i just have a variable called that the game isn't using the variable yet so i have a variable created now let's actually use it and say when repeat every repeat every and instead of setting manually i'm going to say well, use whatever number that it has for that, which, as you recall, is 0.53 or point whatever that was. And if we play the game, there it is, the same game. But what that allows us to do is now, remember, it's called a variable, which means it can vary or change. So what we can do with that is say, well, let, after a few seconds, we need to communicate with here that look things just got real okay <laughs> this is about to get really difficult uh prepare yourself right so how do you communicate that with the players so i think let's like make it kind of dark and gloomy and speed up how often the ice shards are spawning so let's do that we can come down here and say all right new event and i'm gonna call this increase difficulty number one and you can you know make lots of these when well when should it increase difficulty now because i'm a big fan of test quickly as quickly as you can so that you know imagine if you said well you have to wait 30 seconds well it's going to take you at least 30 seconds to test it every time so test it faster so i'm going to say when uh system runtime has ran longer than and I'm going to say just three seconds. Yeah, that's not much time before it increases difficulty, but we'll change that later. So once it's ran longer than three, several things will happen. Number one, the system, the global color that is like the whole scene, I'm going to kind of change this to a little bit of red action. And what do we want to change? All that did is change the color. We want to change how fast it's cloning ice. Right? And it's going to always clone at whatever we have for spawn rate. So what do we need to do? Change the spawn rate. So after three seconds have elapsed, set that color. And we want the variable spawn rate to be set to a new value. And we're going to set it now to, it was 0 0.53. So let's make it like 0 0.25. I don't know. Two four, so it's not a regular interval. Uh, let's try that. Let's see what happens. Could go poorly. I'm not sure. Wait for the little bloop. There it is. Bloop. Okay, we're playing. We're going. Oh, things got ominous. Oh man. Okay, that was a really fast spawn rate, but it did work. Right, that's cool. Oof, yeah, see, whoa, this just got really difficult. But anyways, you get the idea. You could continually increase uh, the difficulty and keep changing the colors. So maybe it gets a little bit darker of a red each time or changes to other colors. Um, but that's how you communicate to the player that things are, uh, things are getting difficult here, right? 
So if you're going to publish this, then you'd probably get that off the screen. Um, and then you could actually uh, export to Unity 3D. Uh, what's nice there is it basically packages it up, like throws it in a suitcase, basically. And then you can go into Unity and use Unity then to export the file. Okay, so I'm just going to say, okay, on my uh, desktop, uh, I'm just going to export that file. Now, once you, uh, we have a tutorial on them. There's a couple of little steps that you need to do there. So I think we're going to throw that link into the chat window so that you guys can uh, jump into that whole tutorial because we're not going to have time to do it right now. But let's say this was the game that I made in Ready and I did all those steps in the tutorial. From here, then, you could set it up under your build settings so that you could export to, like, say, Android. And in the tutorial, I think it's Android that I do in that one. And we're going to export the current game or scene that we have open. And then you could say build. And it would literally create a Android app that you could then put on uh, anywhere you can share an app to. I put it on my Google Drive, and then I actually have it on my Android phone, which is pretty awesome, because I can go from a game that I made and ready, take it into Unity, and export it as an Android app to share with my friends all in one session, which is pretty amazing. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to, to show you was, um, remember in our... Oops. In here, if I said, well, when the game starts, I want it to go to a certain position, right? I don't like where the circle is. Um, we could do this. We could say when the, wait, do I already have a scene start up at the top? Well, that's every frame. If I said, I'll call this scene start. So when system runtime scene start, when the scene starts, I want to set the uh, bordered circles position to, uh, and I'll give it a value. Remember we looked at that other one and I could see what the values were. Let's say I said on the X axis, negative two, and on the Y, negative 1.5, which was kind of up here in the top left corner-ish. Um, let's go verify that. So here's where it is now, but when I hit plus, Oh, geez, that must have been a little too high or something. Or t Wait a minute. I think I messed up my X and Ys. Yep, I did. Uh, I don't know what it's like. Uh, negative 2. This would be a positive 1.5, actually. There we go. There it is. So it set it up to that top left corner. You can see it's here. Boom. Toss it back up there. Now, the reason I show you that is... When you're in Unity, it's a very similar concept. And that same bit of code, I'm going to bring over Visual Studio. So if you just start jumping into Unity, and don't get overwhelmed by this, because if you're new to any kind of um, script-based coding, this looks like a ton of stuff. But once you do it for a little while, it's really not too bad. Um, when the scene starts, we want its position to go to this X and this Y, is basically what that's saying. So you can see, whoops, here's my little guy and my overly heavy guy. If this is zero, zero, it's going to go negative two this way and positive, I think, one. Is that what I said? No, two up there. So when I hit play, boom, there he goes. Negative two, positive two. So that is basically the same exact phrase between ready and then how you do that same thing in Unity. Um, and then with Unity, of course, there's lots of other commands that may not exist in ready. Um, so you can make the next uh, Cuphead or because Cuphead was made in, in Unity. So I think I'm going to cut it there. I want to open it up to questions at this point. Um, we built our game. We've extended the game. Um, let's see if we have any questions in here. Let me turn that temporarily off so you don't get a mirrored screen effect. Because that could be rough. All right. How are we doing? Does anybody have any questions? Do, 
do, do, do. Hi, Tyler. Hi, Donnie. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Zayed. Um, great. Melissa, do you want to add anything here that I missed? <clears throat> Sorry. No, I think you did a great job. Thank you. Um, if anybody is wondering, you when you're ready to bring your game into Unity, you can download the Unity personal version for free. So if you haven't done that already, let me um, let me pull that up and I can copy that into our chat here. Very good. Also, while while you're getting that, um, I didn't share. Uh, if you, when you start getting into this stuff and you start having all kinds of questions and you're thinking, oh man, where am I going to get help on all of this stuff? Well, if you're working in Ready, the best place is to go into the forum. And this is an extremely uh, uh, well covered forum. In other words, you ask a question in here, you're going to get help um, from people that are doing it, from the people that work at Ready. Um, so create an account in here. I think I'm Garlic Suitor in here. Yes, I am Garlic Suitor. Um, so you can always tag me at something and I can come help you um, or just post it in the uh, help. How do I put it in there? Um, if you are working in Unity, they also have a really nice forum. Uh, I mean, there's always Google searching type of stuff too, but um, friendly communities to get get some questions and answers done in there. So make sure you use those when you uh, start getting a little stuck or get frustrated, uh, um, ask questions in there. And just all you need to do when you post a question in the, either one of the forums is say, what's your problem, what you've tried already, and then what your objective is, what are you trying to do? And you'll get help. I think I heard some bloop bloop. So I think we jumped some more Oh, sorry. I always forget to do that. Unity personal ver free version. Yep, you can do all the exporting with that for the uh, Android apps, iOS apps. You can do all that through there. And I think we had the, uh, yep, there's the link to the uh, export your ready video game into Unity or as, a, as an app through there. So that's in there. Cool. Anything else? I don't see any questions, so... I don't see any questions either. I just posted in our chat here the link to the Unity tutorials for when you're ready to move from ready to Unity. Yes. That's what Mark showed yes. earlier in our webinar. Yes. Um, the last I am thing just I'll share, curious but... if anybody in the chat can chime in. Um, are you doing Hour of Code at your school? If you are, maybe give us a thumbs up in the chat and just Curious how many of you are actually enjoying Hour of Code during the school day. So quiet. So quiet is cricket. Um, this <laughs> is all the, in the Unity tutorials. When you go into the Learn and click on Tutorials, um, there's there's some tutorials here. If you have any kind of background, you can jump right into that. You really don't even need any background there, but it can be a lot all at once. Um, so if you even want to take one step lower um, or simpler, do the space chicken one there. Um, I hear the guy that did that one is really pretty good. He's pretty um, good. You might recognize him. <laughs> but well, the reason I say that is because it shows you how to build the game in um, ready and then also a bunch of parallels between that and unity so the whole idea here is to get comfortable and ready and then shift into unity so that makes that uh, that much easier so cool well thanks for coming everybody and uh, i hope to see you in the interwebs somewhere soon uh thanks again we'll see you soon thank you mark bye yeah happy hour of code everybody